Lord, we are grateful for the love that you have for us. We thank you for meeting our needs today through, through this week, and we thank you that your mercies are new every morning. And um, we pray that you would guide and direct us as we worship together today. And we, we do pray for James Taylor and the things he's going through, that you might give him strength and um, just give him some peace and give him, give him some a break from the pain in his back, we pray. Thank you that Marty's here today. We pray that you would continue to be with him and Deb. And we also pray for Grace and pray that she'd get some answers this week. So at least she knows what she's dealing with. And uh, just help each of these folks, all of us really, to trust you with the different circumstances of life that we go through. Because you are always good and you're always at work. We pray that we would be able to respond well to the different things that go on, especially things that we feel are negative uh, in our lives, that we might find the good that you have in them for our growth and our sanctification and, and all things. Pray that you would help us now as we study your word together. We pray that it would be a, a blessing and encouragement to each one of us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to say our verses. Uh, Colossians, it'll be Colossians 1, 9 through 11. How are you doing on this? Not well? I forgot to give the quiz. I was going to give a quiz today, but now I got the answers up there in front of you. What? You can't remember these five things in these two verses? Which five things? Which five things? The first five elements of the periodic table. Didn't you get that learned? We're talking about the five prayer requests, uh, yeah, five prayer requests that we include in, the, in this passage. <clears throat> so here we go, Colossians 1, 9 through 11. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom, spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. There's your five. Next verse, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy. Colossians 1, 9 through 11. Okay, last week we talked especially about um, verse 20. So if you have your Bibles open, Colossians 1, 20. By him, by Jesus, to reconcile all things to himself. We talked a lot about that. And I wanted just to focus on this last, um, last section. Having made peace through the blood of his cross. Having made peace through the blood of his cross. I was putting together a Christmas card that we can send or give to our neighbors when we hand out our peanut brittle in a couple of weeks. And also to share with Ruth's uh, physical therapist. This is her last week for that. So I was thinking of the passage, the, what we quote at Christmas, the angels said, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So I was reflecting on that a little bit. And you know, was it uh, Longfellow that wrote that the poem that we sing? I heard the bells on Christmas Day. Was that Henry Longfellow? Um, and he, he said there's no, part of his reflection on that was that there's no peace on earth. It was distressing. I, I've been thinking about this this week as I've been trying to put something together. Um, there's two locations in that verse. The angel said, glory to God in the highest, and then there's something on earth. All right, so there's, there's two places. So glory to God in the highest, and I think what, the, what, he, what they're saying is, this is my interpretation of it. It's not, it's not necessarily that after when Jesus comes, then there's all of a sudden peace everywhere and nobody's fighting anymore. Everything's, we know that that's not true because Jesus himself said, you're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars and there's lots going on. So I think what it means is this peace we're talking about here, heaven, there's glory to God in the heavens and God attitude toward the people here is one of peace and goodwill, because we learned last week, God has reconciled 
all things to himself. And in the passage in, in Corinthians, we talked about God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, the whole world, not imputing people's trespasses against them. So from God's side, there's reconciliation. It takes two sides to reconcile. We, I use the marriage example. The husband, the wife might want to reconcile with the husband, and he's got his arms folded. He said, no, no way, I'm out of here. And even if everything's good from her side, she really wants to get back together, it takes two. So from God's side, I believe God's, God has reconciled himself with the world. He reconciled the, world, the whole world unto himself. He's not counting people's trespasses against them. There's peace from God's point of view. Now, on man's point of view, most people, are nat well, actually are, all of us, our natural condition is to do what? To be the one that folds our arms and we're saying, we're not having you ruling over us. What are you talking about, God? I don't want to do things your way. I want to do things my way. And so back to that Christmas passage, I think what that's saying is, glory to God in the highest, and <coughs> God's attitude toward earth is one of peace and reconciliation to the people on earth. I think that's what he's saying, what they're saying and what the angels were saying. So Romans 5.1, maybe you know that passage. Romans 5.1 said, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace. peace. And what's the preposition there? Peace with God. Peace with God. Um, through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the way we get peace with God. Luke 2.14 is the passage I just mentioned. Uh, where the angels were talking. And uh, Colossians 1.21 is coming up, because we're on verse 20 now. Um, 21 says, And you who were once alienated, this is Colossians 1, verse 21, you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled. So even though we were enemies, while we were sinners, Christ died for us, right? While we were enemies, God made peace with us from his side. I think that's what that's saying. Having made peace through the blood of his cross. It's his sacrificial death on the cross and the literal blood that was shed on the cross that brought us that reconciliation and that peace. And so why were the angels so excited? I've got good news of great joy. You know, Glory to God in the highest. Heaven's got the issue settled with the earth. Now we got to call on people on earth to be reconciled with God. And that, in 2 Corinthians 5, that's the message we're supposed to preach, is it not? God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. He's given us the ministry of reconciliation. I can't, I can't quote it exactly, but he says, announce to people, get reconciled with God. It's clear from his side, you need to reconcile yourself from your side. It only does it when your back is changed. Yeah. I don't know what's going on with that. Is that the same problem Pastor was having last week during the church service? All right, next verse, you, which we just read, and you who were once alienated and enemies. I think it's interesting, in your mind. Enemies in your mind by wicked works. Um, you, he's talking to you and me. I wrote up there, even you, even me. You who once, once, a long time ago, or last week, or whenever you came to know Christ, before that. You were alienated and enemies, but now um, he has reconciled. Ephesians 2 talks about the situation of people that are lost. And this, this passage sticks with my mind a lot, when, especially when you see, uh, it's true of everybody who's lost, but some people seem really lost. You know what I mean? They just... Their life seems to just be in chaos. Um, Ephesians talks about people being without hope and without God. Um, what must it be like to be without any hope at all? No. Isn't that isn't hope one of the things we talk about at Christmas too? People, yeah, Lindy, what were you going to say? It's depressing. It's depressing. We have to have hope. And it's not hope so hope. My dad used to say, it's not hope so hope. I hope everything turns out okay. You know, that kind of hope. Just kind of a, 
even sometimes people have a have a hopeful attitude even when it looks pretty dire, but it doesn't it isn't based on anything. Something tragic happens in their family and they go, I hope it all works out. And that's one kind of hope, but it's not a it's not a good kind. It's not the kind of promised hope that God gives us. Um, you know, even we've got the hope of heaven, don't we? If if our lives are lost in some tragedy or illness or whatever, um, it is a loss. But we, Paul says, to be at home with Christ is far better. It's a gain. Um, yeah. I remember reading somewhere that uh, biblical hope is future certainty. Uh, in, in other words, it's it's a done deal. It's money in the bank. But um, piggybacking on that, which is unrelated to what I'm going to say next, but I'm looking at the verse here, and you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, uh, that seems the, the wicked works kind of goes along with enemies in your mind. And my translation separates those. So we got the alienation, which is, you know, obviously our position in God, the hostility of our mental problem, and then doing problem, our behavior. Then, our Two separate aspects so of it. The three things there that this translation has. How does it read? Read it to me. And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled. So you're hostile in your mind, and isn't the hostility in your mind what motivates the doing of the of the deeds? Yeah, Jamie. Um, I hope I'm not contradicting you. What did you just say? It is not the hostility in your mind that's motivating. The I said it is the hostility in your mind that is motivating. Oh. It's a re the, the wicked works, phys the actual physical wicked works done in your body come because of something going on in your mind. You're wicked. Oh. You're wicked. You can also go the other way. That's what I was going to say. That, our, mm -hmm. that what we do actually sets, can darken our minds. And so these people in Colossae had been worshiping <coughs> idols, which darkened their minds and made them, um, you know, feel hostile towards the true and living God. That's just the they go kind of hand in hand, don't they? Because you, you have something going on in your mind, you buy into a false, a false uh, narrative of some sort, and then you're worshiping the idols. And in our day, we're worshiping all kinds of things, money, power, prestige, whatever. And then that, that, that corrupts us. And then there's, it's, like, it's almost like Romans 1. There's a step, it's a downward, mm -hmm. downward spiral. Phil? Um, with the, the wicked works, in mind, there's a footnote that goes to Titus 1.15, and it says that um, that to the unbelieving, nothing is pure, but even in their mind and conscience, they are defiled. And that kind of goes hand in hand, that the, the defiled mind and the wicked works are, the works are what you would expect of a defiled mind. So read that again, that by a wicked mind, um, no, what's it say? So the whole verse is, to the pure, all things are pure, yeah. but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, even their mind and conscience are defiled. Yeah, to, the, to those who aren't pure, to the impure, to the lost, everything is defiled, basically. Yeah. Um, I think there's a verse in the Old Testament that says, the plowing of the wicked is sin. So you've got an unbelieving farmer out there, and he's plowing, and he's taking advantage of the, of the uh, common grace, the fact that there's rain and crops grow and there's sunshine and all of that. But because he's not a believing person, um, even his work is, is a sinful thing because he's got the wrong motive somehow. Uh, that being, being thankful is a real key, because that Romans passage, you know, that, that was one of the first trip points, wasn't it, in, in, the, in the downward thing? They, they didn't worship God as God, neither were they thankful. That's the first step of that degradation, that degrading going downward. And people don't realize that. People think, people think I haven't done anything terrible against God. But that, but yet, there's not a for for people that are unsaved. There's, they can go through this Christmas season and spend money and enjoy all some of the things that, the celebrations that Christianity has brought. 
it's to excess in, in a lot of cases, but it, it's because of Christ that, that Christmas is, exists as a holiday. Um, and yet they're not, they're not thankful. Or some people are just thankful, but it's like to the air, you know. I'm just so thankful. And what does that mean exactly? Yeah, Paul? It's very convicting to think that one of the telltales of being thankful is contentment. Right. Being contented and it goes, is a result of being thankful. I'm thankful I'm just not content with my situation. <laughs> You should see those as opposites, you know, because we all do that to some degree. I'm a very thankful person. I just wish this weather would get better, you know, if, you know, if it's a bad, well, then you're not really very thankful about that, are you? And we are, we are supposed to be thankful. You know, there's two kinds, there's two prepositions with thankful, too, because we say I, we should be thankful in everything. Almost every Christian agrees with that. In everything, in every situation, we should be thankful. But there's another passage that talks about being thankful for everything and that's harder that's harder all right so in your mind wicked works work, wicked works are worked out um, although you can have wicked works in your mind too I think you can act out things in your mind um, in the body of his flesh verse 22 in the in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless above report. I think this is important. I, I emphasize the, the fact that in the body of his flesh, his human body, not a spiritual body, but a human body, through the death of that body. That's not a complete sentence, but it, that's a, I'm making a point here. And we don't, we don't fight, at least knowingly, Gnosticism too much anymore, but it's still out here in our culture. Gnosticism has a belief that the spiritual is superior to the physical. In Christianity, we almost buy into that, but we're thinking normally, even though we don't really recognize it, when we talk about spirituality versus the body, we're thinking about the sinful body, the body that has the sin nature still in it, and the, the old nature we sometimes say. So the spiritual versus that. But the Gnostics believed that the body itself and physical things are evil. And only things of the spirit, things, things you can't see. I don't, when I say spiritual in this way, I'm not talking about Christianity necessarily either. I'm just talking about things of the spirit, spiritual kinds of things. Um, are where the importance is. And those people, in the early days, um, the Apostle John had to fight against this a lot. In the early days of Christianity, the Gnostics were really powerful in there. And they argued that, that Jesus' body was not a real body, because that would, that would have been, that's absurd to them. That's absurd that God, who is spiritual, He's a spirit. God is a spirit. That's the way I'm using the word. So God is a spirit that he would live in something made of dirt and stuff. I'm not even talking about the sin part. I'm just talking about the fact that it's, you know, we're made of dust, material, chemicals. And so they said that's absurd. It only looked like he, was, had, he had a body. So they had these big disagreements. That's why you had some of those councils in the early church where they said, we believe that God in Christ, had a physical body. He actually died on a, with a physical body on an actual cross and all of that. That's very important. But there's some Gnosticism in our culture, too. And it shows up here and there. And I, I just this just caught my attention here. He, has, he says, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh. Paul is saying that on purpose. Colossians is partly attacking the Gnostic. He's telling those people that are, there's some Gnostics in the congregation. And he's saying, you were reconciled because of the death of that body. You understand what I'm saying? It's the body. Jesus' the body died. His heart stopped. It's a physical body, not a spiritual kind of a vision, a dream, a, a swooning or anything. It's a physical body. Jesus' Jesus's body had bones 
and ligaments and a heart and stomach and all those things. He digested food like all the rest of us, right? That's what we believe. It's a physical body. And Paul is saying here, especially to the Gnostic people in his congregation, at, at, not his congregation, but the congregation at Colossae, he said, he reconciled you people through the death of that physical body because that heart stopped and his body died. The cells stopped working, the stomach stopped working, the brain and his physical body stopped working. It all, he was dead. And he wanted the Gnostics to know that, and to them that was absurd that anybody would even say that. And it's kind of interesting even for us to think about the fact that we were reconciled because that body died on a cross. Um, so, going on. In the body of his flesh through death, I love this next section. To present you, okay? To present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. Well, what does it mean to present to, present you? What kinds of things happen in our culture where they say, I present you? Offer, offer, Pardon? Offer the person to somebody. Or offer you, you ever hear somebody in front say, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you? It's an introduction. It's an introduction of something. They're going to they're gonna bring somebody out here and maybe he's a famous person or whatever, you know. And it says he's going to present you Who's, who's the he? He's going to present you. Jesus, Jesus God, somebody's going to, God, God is going to present you. Ladies and gentlemen, here's Glenn. Well, it's not going to be ladies and gentlemen. Who is he going to present him to? God the Father. To God the Father. So, is, here God the Father, here's Glenn. You know, here's Sherry, here's Lindy. I'm presenting these people to God. This is what God's doing. He presents through death to present you, and then you got three adjectives there. Holy, blameless, and above reproach. In whose sight? God's sight. So you get presented to God the Father. And I'll go back to my Glenn example. So Glenn, you know, here you are. Jesus is presenting you, God the Father, here's Glenn. And in God's sight, God looks at Glenn and he sees him how? Holy. Holy means set apart, um, dedicated to, I think I have a, um, dedicated to God for special service. You know, Paul uses that word of vessels in, in your houses. Some vessels in your houses are reserved for trash. You don't put your trash in your best, you know, vessel, whatever you have here, you know. Um, so we dedicate things to certain things. In the Old Testament, you had certain vessels that were dedicated to God, and then they had certain things. You weren't supposed to touch them, and you had to do certain things. And if you had, if you had a little sore, you couldn't touch that table because then you defiled the whole thing and then maybe God would strike you dead. Who knows? Um, so he presents Glenn and all the rest of us holy and then we get to this one. Blameless. You dig through the rubble and you can't find anything to blame him for. This is God now we're talking about. I could dig through your record and not find much maybe because I don't know how to do it. Um, how to get to all the paperwork and all the stuff to see how good you really are, besides on Sunday, you know. But God's got the ability to go through all that, doesn't he? And so Jesus presents Glenn and all the rest of us to God the Father, and God says, yeah, there's another one of my blameless ones. I've looked through the record. I can't find anything wrong with him. Why? Why can't God find anything wrong with him? You're washed in the blood and... It, 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 that means there's nothing on your record at all. Uh, so then I could blame you for, there's nothing on your record, your record's blank. So now I'm looking for some good stuff and there's, your record's blank. So I'm going to blame you now for having not done good to some people because there's nothing on your, it's a blank card. We don't want a blank card. 
You want a good card with nothing blamable on it. How do you get that kind of card, that kind of record? The great exchange. God made Christ to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness. The, righteousness of the records get switched <coughs> on purpose. Have you ever had your record switched anywhere where you got the wrong? I used to, I used to laugh at, uh, remember uh, Jan and Jan? Um, he said, we don't go to the same doctor. I mean, he's that with his, can you picture him saying this? Because their names are the same, yeah. basically. He said, we don't want our records switched. Um, God took your, the record of your life, gave it to Jesus. It was a nasty record. Jesus went to the cross because of all the bad stuff you did. And... God took Jesus' record, which says he was perfect. He not only avoided all of the wrongs, but he loved people. He loved his neighbor just like he loved himself. He loved God with every ounce of his heart. All of those records got put on your account. So when God looks at your record, it's not just empty because you didn't do anything wrong because it's all washed away. It's got Jesus' righteousness imputed on your record. So when, when God looks at your record, he sees you as having loved your neighbor as yourself and loving God with every ounce of your energy, time, everything's fully dedicated to God. That's, the, that's the, what's happening here. Um, Doug? That imputation is, I think, beautifully set forth in verse 22 cancels out the holy, blameless, and above reproach, cancels out the three accusations in 21. So there is an exchange there. Right, there's an exchange there, right. <clears throat> exactly. And above reproach? What's a reproach? It's like, one, of the, one dictionary says, blameless. Okay, well now we got blameless and blameless. Some, there's got to be a difference in connotation anyway, a little bit of reproach. If somebody reproaches you, what are they doing? Hmm? Correcting. Correcting. Correcting, finding some fault, some, some dissatisfying thing about you somewhere, some, something, to, something to criticize. Yeah, Paul? The main concept of, of blame is transference. So when I'm like going back to the Garden of Eden, you blame them transferred to yeah, it's not my fault. It's the woman you gave me. Yeah, because then I don't have to take responsibility. Right. So no, none of that can go on here, and there's no reproach, no, no, um, no fault finding. No. Yeah, Jamie. Yeah, there's some connotation, some feeling type sense in those words for us in, in English. Um, but I think the point is, it's all erased. There's, there's no blame, no reproach, no fault finding, nothing. God can't find anything wrong with you. That's the way we're going to be presented. So you were once alienated. Remember where we started? We were enemies of God. We weren't just nice, clean living Americans that realized we needed a savior. Nice, clean living. I mean, good, honest people go to work every day, raise a nice family, do all that stuff. They're lost. God considers them enemies in their minds and their wicked works because, like we just said a little bit ago, everything we do is a sin if we're, if we're not in Christ uh, in the sense that it's not done with the proper motive. It's, uh, um, sometimes we, as Christians, minimize too much. We say, I'm a, I'm basically, even as a Christian, I'm a good person because I go to church, I have the right... Bible, I wear the right clothes, I treat people nice, as nice as I can, and all that. And we have to realize that um, all that niceness is good. I mean, we should, be, we should be nice, kind people. But are you as kind as you should be in all the situations of your week? Really, honestly, are you as kind to your husband as, or wife as you should be? 
Well, yeah, most of the time, well, that's the problem. Where's the rest of the time? You know what I mean? You're, if you're nice to your spouse, 95% of the time, in a, what we think in America is, that's pretty good. We should get an award for that. And God looks at it and says, I see, I see a 5% deficiency here. If, if God was just judging you on his own standard, God's perfect. We all fall short of the glory of God. That's the point of the gospel. So you fall 5% short. Now you can't go through every day beating yourself over the head with it for that. But that's why you came to Christ to, to have him as your savior. Now he finds you blameless in that regard. Right? And we have to remember that. And then we don't go, oh, now you've made me really feel awful. I'm not perfect. Well, no, we all know that. Sometimes, sometimes I think, sometimes I think we, we even have too high of an expectation. Sometimes, have you ever had something happen to you and you say, I can't really believe I said that? Or I can't believe I thought that? I mean, I had students probably I would like to wring their neck, you know? Um, and you say to yourself, I can't, what, what does that mean about you then if you say, I can't believe that I would just really want to give the guy a punch? What's the, matter, what's, the, what's the problem with your opinion of yourself if you say, I can't believe I would think that? You're thinking of yourself more highly than you ought. Yeah, that's right. You're surprised that you wanted to punch somebody out? Really? That means you must have a pretty good opinion of yourself, which is a problem. Because we're fallen, God says. We're fallen. And we need to acknowledge that. Okay? Okay, so holy, blameless, and above reproach. And we talked a little bit about this. Who is going to present you in this way? Who's the presenter? I think it's Jesus presenting us to God the Father. Romans 8.28 and following. How are we doing on time here? Romans, you know Romans 8.28, right? We're still talking about blameless, above reproach, acceptable to God and all of that. Romans 8.28 and following. Romans 8, 28, you know. And we know, what? All things work together for good. To those who love God. And to those who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, he also called. Whom he called, he justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. And without getting into all the big doctrinal things that are underlying this, in other words, God does a complete job. He gets you, he calls you, and he gets you justified all the way down through. But here's what I want to look at. What then should we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? That's the question in verse 31. What's the answer to that question? If God's for you, who can be against you? Even without knowing the rest of it, just that question. No one. If God's on your side, who's going to be against you? Yeah. That phrase Right. Nobody can come. No, no. If God's on your side, and we say, well, de the devil is a cu accuser. He is, but he doesn't, he doesn't have any bearing before God when he accuses you. Who does he hurt the most when he accuses me? He, accuses you. he comes to you. What kind of a Christian do you think you are? You say you're so good, he, whatever, and then, but that, that argument's not going to get anywhere with God. Because God's the one who justified and called and did the whole work for us. Um, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son. I'm talking about God now. God did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with, uh, with him give us everything? If he gave us his son, he's going to give us everything. We have to believe that. And the, the no condemnation and the, the no reproach and blamelessness all go with that. That's part of, this, part of the whole package. Who will, who will bring any charge? You have another question. Who shall give, bring a charge against God's elect? Nobody. It is God who justifies. He's the, he's the judge. He gets to decide who gets, who gets off and who doesn't. It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. So who's going to separate us from the love of God? And the answer, nobody. 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 So we'll leave it there today, and we'll pick it up next week, Lord willing. Tom? The self-condemnation. I mean, that's why I can't hold myself and say, uh, God 
You have to believe God. Yeah, he says, I saved you. We, we have work, there's work to be done. There's sanctification work, that's what God's working on. But he will finish it. He who started the good work in you is going to finish it. He who started the good work in your children is going to finish it. Um, you have those promises. We have to claim more and more, and I'm, I'm trying to do this more and more, we have to claim God's promises um, and believe them. Doug, was your hand up? You just brought up sanctification. And I, I read verse 30, and I'm just always amazed that he jumps from justified to glorified. Uh, and so the, that whole idea of our, our current life and everything, it's just, it's a done deal. It's a done deal. He's not going to fail at this. He's going to make every one of us, isn't it? He's going to make every one of us Christ-like without fail. God never makes any mistakes. In, I can't even picture God starting a project and going, oh, well, that one didn't work. How can that be? Oops. All right? No. So let's pray. Lord, we're grateful for your word. Thank you for the truth you've given us. We pray that we'd be encouraged by, the, by these things. Um, we, need, we need to recognize your greatness but not just greatness in creation, which is immense, but the greatness of your salvation. Um, we shouldn't neglect um, so great salvation. We shouldn't neglect thinking about it. We should praise you for it and be thankful for it every single day. And we realize that we're, we realize we're not perfect. Uh, and, but you're working on us, and we grow and we learn, and we thank you for that, for that process. We pray that we would just trust you because the outcome is assured already and we can count on it. Be with the next service. We pray that you would bless and encourage pastor as he ministers the word to us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.